Hello and welcome to Simplified on Powerdrift where we take complicated automotive ideas and break them down into small bite-sized pieces that you can use in your life with motorcycles. In this video, we are talking about thermal runaway or in layman's terms, why electric vehicles catch fire. In this video, we'll talk about what actually happens before the fire starts, what you can do as a customer to prevent the fires from happening to you and what you need to watch out for when you're buying an electric vehicle. If you're ready, I need you to do me a small favor and hit four buttons for us, the subscribe and the bell notification icon so that you don't miss out, the thumbs up because I know you like this video and share this video with your friends so we can transfer this information to as many people as humanly possible. So, to understand what thermal runaway is, Let's take the example of a basket full of apples. Now, if there is a worm in an apple and we don't remove this apple from the basket, what will happen is that eventually this worm will find its way into other apples or replicate and create more worms that will spoil the entire basket. A thermal runaway is a very simple situation, very, very similar to this one, except that it happens at an extremely accelerated pace. And the reason for that is that to do their jobs, batteries have to produce heat. Now, each battery consists of a whole bunch of cells which can be organized in a number of configurations physically and they can have a number of chemicals inside and there are multiple configurations of electric batteries that happen from how they're constructed and what chemicals they use. But what is common to all of them is that when you charge these batteries, there is some heat that we have to deal with and when you discharge these batteries, which is when we use the batteries to perform propulsion, when we use our EVs, we also generate heat. And the heat is a source of trouble because most electric vehicle battery chemistries don't really work in hot weather. This is why a battery that works in Europe where the average summer temperatures barely ever cross 25 degrees Celsius will have a much easier time than in India where average summer temperatures are easily 40 degrees or more. So, what the electric vehicle manufacturers do when they design their batteries first is to ensure that there is a way to read what the temperatures of each cell is. So each cell in the battery is connected to a sensor array and the sensor array's job is to keep a check on each cell individually. And the idea is if a certain cell starts to show the signs of overheating, you can take all function away from that cell temporarily until it cools down so that it doesn't cause a problem. And the reason why it could cause a problem is because the reaction that we use to charge and discharge batteries are exothermic, they produce heat. And when you have a lot of exothermic reactions coming together, there is a small chance that each reaction can cause every next reaction to become easier to do because ambient heat is higher until the point where you lose control of the process. That's what is thermal runaway. And in most cases, this is what's happening. What is happening is it begins with one or two cells overheating. The system is not able to intervene in time. The heating leads to the creation of gases and these gases are flammable. Eventually, the pressure of these gases will cause a problem, whether that problem is a ballooning in a cell or in the battery itself. But once this gas is out there, it is very, very easy to ignite the gas. Once you ignite the gas, you have what looks like an EV fire, the kind of videos that you've been seeing on social media. What you should know about EV fires is that once they start, they burn much hotter than normal fires and therefore they are extremely difficult to put out. If you do some research, you'll find there are examples of vehicles that were completely controlled by the fire department. And once the fire department turned around, the fire restarted again. Obviously, the manufacturer doesn't want to have to deal with it either. So what they do is a system of checks and balances. One of them we've already discussed where each cell is being monitored in real time to ensure that an overheating cell can be removed from the process. It doesn't automatically mean that your performance will degrade or that your range will fall by a certain amount. It just means that out of say 12 cells in your EV, one or two have been sidelined for a moment waiting for the temperature to stabilize again so that they can be re-employed again. Remember, overheating cells are also losing their battery chemistry. It has an implication on the longevity of the cell also. So it is critical, given how expensive EV batteries are, that the manufacturer makes a good system for it. But just like with motorcycle engines, once you have a source of heat, you need a way to dissipate this heat. So in the exact same way that ICE engines work, you can air cool your battery, you can force air cool your battery, or you can liquid cool your battery. In theory, this is the exact same system that an ICE engine uses and we have a video on how these cooling systems work. But fundamentally, you can design your battery to sit in a stream of air as your EV moves through space and the stream of air carries the heat of the battery away. If that isn't good enough, you can add a fan to the process and ensure that whether the EV stops or moves, the airstream going past the battery is a much stronger one than it would normally be. 
And obviously the most complicated solution is liquid cooling where you have a water cooling jacket and you have coolant that flows through the process. And in EV cars, you'll very rarely hear about thermal runaway and these kind of things being a real everyday challenge, primarily because they are much larger, they are much heavier and therefore integrating an efficient, effective liquid cooling system is just much simpler than doing it on an EV scooter where packaging itself is a huge challenge. That brings us to the next challenge, which is the construction of the battery pack itself. Now, we've decided that we want to put 12 cells, we want to use a certain configuration to pack them together, we've decided how the sensor wires are going to go, but this entire thing has to be put in a package that can be put on a vehicle. The reason why that is a big step is because, remember, vehicles have to be able to, for example, go through waterlogged streets, and water should not cause a problem for the battery. It needs to be that kind of waterproof. Indian roads aren't the greatest, vibration is a challenge for the battery cells, so the battery pack also has to be designed to absorb a certain amount of vibration, which could be quite a bit higher than what Europe would consider acceptable. Indian conditions are hotter, so the heat challenge is also there. Uh, our electricity voltages fluctuate more than normal, that is another challenge, and these are all the checks and balances that are not only built into the construction of the battery pack itself, it's also built into the software that monitors the battery as well. To give you an example, you could make the casing for the battery out of plastic. Industrial plastics are very strong, they are much cheaper than metal in some cases, and it's not really that hard to do. But as soon as you put plastic in, the challenge for your cooling systems become higher because plastics don't radiate heat as well as metals. If you were to make this out of steel, you'll get a very strong battery pack, but that comes with a weight penalty and batteries themselves are quite heavy. So suddenly, the performance that you can extract from your EV becomes less because your EVs become heavier. And therefore, you'll find that a lot of the upper end of the manufacturers will stick to aluminium battery packs because aluminium is strong, aluminium is light, and aluminium does radiate heat quite well. But as the Aether guys like to point out, how the battery pack is welded and closed in itself is a huge challenge because the tolerances needed to create a safe battery pack are actually very, very high. Not something you cannot achieve, but something that requires a lot more thought and a lot more process than you think. So when it all comes together, what you get is a situation where it doesn't matter what you do with your EV, it absorbs the strain. And therefore, you plug it to a fast charger, the machine figures out how to keep the battery cool while a lot of current flows into the battery. You ride it hard, the system figures out how to keep the battery in control while you're discharging it as fast a rate as possible. When manufacturers cut corners or their verification and validation systems don't work very well, things can slip through the cracks and that's where the problems begin. So if you have an EV and you're riding it along and it's a hot summer day and suddenly you start getting a warning from the EV which says uh, overheating, whether it's the motor or the battery, that's usually a sign that the cooling system is not able to dissipate heat at the rate that you're generating it. This is not necessarily your fault. It's not that you were on the throttle the whole time and you caused the problem. It could be a combination of factors. For example, if you take an EV, put it on a fast charger, you get a hot battery. Then you put it into the fastest mode possible and ride it as hard as possible. It should not be very difficult for you to find a thermal cutoff standing in your way. Most EVs will give you some sort of warning that your performance is about to go away because a thermal cutoff is about to be in your way. This is the right way to do it. Right? It's the machine telling you that so far, when you opened the throttle to 100%, you got so many nm of torque, but because of the heat situation in the motor, in the battery, we are no longer able to deliver 100% of that torque. So far, to control the thermal, we are only going to be able to give you 30% of that torque. It's a fair warning and it is, to me, a safety system that needs to be designed every time there was a thermal cutoff. The machine should not go into thermal cutoff without warning the rider that's about to do this to them. Thermal runaway is the next step. If all of these thermal cutoffs cannot contain the problem of heat, then you have a serious problem. And when things slip through the cracks, that's where the real danger of thermal runaway happens. Not unlike how an atomic bomb goes off, where you start with one atom and that one atom gets the rest of the bomb to go off, and it happens in such a short span of time that you get an explosion. So as a customer, what you should be paying attention to is whether the material used to make your battery pack is aluminium or plastic. Plastic battery packs generally don't dissipate heat as well as metal, and therefore a metal battery pack should automatically be superior unless the plastic one incorporates, for example, liquid cooling, which again, in an EV scooter is very difficult to do. In terms of impact testing and vibration testing, there are some basic rules in play, which the ARAI and other certification agencies use, but I don't believe these are the world's highest standards, and I believe the government is revaluating now, given the fact that there are so many EV fires going on. But as a customer, assuming that you already have an EV in the house, what you need to do basically is pay attention to how much heat the system might have based on what you've been doing. 
For example, if you're in Delhi, the ambient temperature is 47 degrees because it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, maybe fast charging that scooter at that point of time is not the smartest thing to do because you've already got high ambient heat and fast chargers will add heat further to that system. In the same way, on the hottest day, if this is the kind of thing that worries you, maybe you don't want to be in the performance mode, maybe you want to stick to economy mode because the ambient heat is high and you don't want to be another source of heat being added to the problem and just making yourself run closer and closer to thermal cutoffs. Hopefully, the cutoff is your last issue. It doesn't get beyond that because when it does get beyond that, things are a little bit out of control and at that point, an EV fire can happen. Is there something you can physically do to prevent fires? Honestly, outside of buying the right brand of EVs and bringing them home, not really. So it is critical that you buy a scooter from a brand you trust, where you can say that I know that this brand went through the process of testing, of validation and verification. The reports in the media suggest, the reports on the forum suggest that these scooters generally don't go into thermal cutoffs. And therefore, the chances that they'll go into a situation where there's an active fire is even further away from normal. But what I always remind people is that for 135 or 40 years or something like that, human beings have been using a very, very flammable liquid called petrol and we cite it between our legs and ride motorcycles every day. In cars, we take 60, 70, 80 liters of the stuff and we sit right on top of it and drive every day and we never think of that as a fire risk because in time, we've stabilized that technology, we understand how to make it so that car explosions or bike explosions are not something we deal with every day. In the same way, the EV scooter will also evolve the stabilization of the battery, the thermal stabilization, the longevity, all of these issues will also be sorted out. But if you're buying an EV scooter today, you are an early adopter entering this field at the very beginning and therefore the challenges are bigger and the solutions are relatively fewer. But that's all it is. If this concerns you a lot, Simple solution, delay your EV purchase by a couple of years and somebody will have a far more stable solution, whether it comes from the authorities having more stringent tests or it comes from a way to make batteries that are much safer or a better way to construct the battery cell or any combination of the above. But as of today, what you can do as a customer riding or driving an EV today is be aware that heat is the biggest challenge for these batteries and you have a role to play in it. On a hot day, it requires you to go as little as 10 or 20% slower and things will just be calmer. On a hot day, figure out whether you want to use a fast charger today or use a slower charger, which will take longer, but the entire process is safer. And remember, the bigger the brand is, the more the onus is on them to ensure that the process is well controlled so that even if you're misbehaving at the worst way possible, it's 48 degrees outside, you have just used a fast charger and you still want to ride your scooter in the maximum performance mode, if you trust the manufacturer, the worst case scenario is the vehicle will warn you that this is overheating a system and just take away a measure of performance from you rather than stop your ride completely. But that's the thing about brands, right? We all say that a certain brand stands for certain values. In the EV market today, it is more critical than ever that you pay attention to what the values of these brands are because it has an implication of what kind of engineering they're doing and what kind of an experience you will get from your EV. But thermal runaways, it's not like they're happening every day anyway. And as time passes, as this technology matures, they will become less and less of a problem until in probability terms, they're at the same level as an IC catching fire and exploding. Until that time, all you have to do is be a little bit more careful. And the other thing you have to do, subscribe button, bell notification icon, give us a thumbs up if you like the video and please do show it to your friends. Thank you so much for watching. This is Simplified on Powerdrift.